Good evening. Welcome to the British Library this evening. I'm John. I'm the head of events at the British Library. It's where my great honour to work. This evening, you're literally sitting on top of the complete works of Ian Fleming. The basement's extending deep, deep underground here. Every single edition is there, and they are in pristine condition. But they're available to, for you to research alongside everything else that we might have. So it gives us a particular honour, like any great author, to house that, and also for tonight to be honouring the publication of the honourable successor to those great works, Double or Nothing by Kim Sherwood. So we're, we're absolutely delighted. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. We'll be in conversation shortly with Kim and Charlie Higson, uh, another great post-Fleming -bond, post Bond author. Um, after that, there'll be a chance to ask some questions. If you're here in person, you'll be able to put your hand up and wait for the mic and ask the question in the normal way. If you're watching online, and greetings to you from wherever you are around the world, you will be able to fill in the uh, question form below the screen and ask, put your question, and we'll read some of those out later. Again, after that, we'll be having a book signing. Kim and Charlie will be signing their books downstairs by the bookshop. Uh, the bar will be also open for a bit longer. A few more um, martinis there, if you can still stand. And um, we'll be open for another half an hour in the bar and then the bookshop until every last copy has been sold. So it only leaves me to uh, hand over to um, introduce our guest tonight to Diggory Laycock, representing Ian Fleming Publications Limited. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, how lovely to see you all here at the uh, British Library on the launch day of Double or Nothing, the first novel in the new Double O section series by Kim Sherwood. And hello to all those online as well. Uh, my name is Diggory Laycock. I'm on the board of Ian Fleming Publications and a member of the Fleming family. You're not here to see me, so I'll be brief and uh, introduce our pair of excellent speakers, participants, interlocutors. I wasn't quite sure what the right word was um, for this evening's discussion. We're very lucky to have with us two superb writers who've both written the world of Bond, but from different approaches. They're both huge Bond fans, and it's always fascinating to hear what they have to say about 007 and about writing. I spent most of this afternoon trying to work out how to avoid the old trope of saying, so-and-so needs no introduction, and then giving an introduction. But I failed. So um, Charlie Higson needs no introduction. <laughs> He's in the pantheon of British comedy, having completely changed the shape and direction of sketch comedy with the massively popular Fast Show. Together with Paul Whitehouse, he wrote, wrote for Harry Enfield's TV show. And on radio, he brought us down the line, again with Paul. Um, as should be obvious from his presence here, he's also a very successful writer. His latest novel, Whatever Gets You Through the Night, was published earlier this year to rave reviews. Preceding that was his successful seven strong The Enemy post-apocalyptic young adult series. And in the late 2000s, we at Ian Fleming Publications were delighted to lure him into writing the five young Bond novels, which posed the challenge, how do you tell the story to children of a young man on the cusp of adulthood who most of us think of as someone with our other grown-up tastes and hobbies. Um, but he did superbly. We're equally lucky to have with us Kim Sherwood. Kim's debut novel, Testament, is an excellent book, and I can't recommend it to you highly enough. If you haven't already got a copy, go out and get one right now, or rather soon after the event, not right now, as soon as you can. It's quite a different tone to what's going to be discussed tonight, but that just highlights how versatile a writer is. she is. So it comes as no surprise, she's a lecturer in creative writing at the University of Edinburgh. Kim's debut novel, uh, for us, is set in the world of Bond and Double O's, is Double or Nothing. It's released today, and I have to say that this is a very exciting moment for us at Ian Film Publications, because finally everyone is able to get hold of it. We've been planning the Double O series for a while, and it's so good to see something that for us has been purely theoretical and secret for such a long time spring into a truly great start to the series in a superb thriller from a great author. It was when we found Kim that we knew we had something special and that our new double agents would be safe in her hands, even if they weren't necessarily going to be safe themselves. Um, it's not easy to do what Kim's done, blending both the familiar world of universal exports and the brand new characters who've all made the grade from double o to double O's, but aren't just clones of that guy in the dinner jacket. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to read the book when it was delivered by Kim to us last year, so I'm rather unfairly, highly impatient to read the next installment, even as Double or Nothing hits the shelves. 
and I bet you all will be too as soon as you've read it. It's a superb book full of excitement, beautifully drawn international locations, and an excellent set of new, to us, 00 agents. That's far too much for me anyway, so I'll hand over to you all come to see. Welcome to the stage, Charlie and Kim. Thank you, thank you very much, and, and hello there. I was very tempted to come on and do a third introduction <laughs> to Kim, and we could have an evening where everybody just introduces <laughs> each other, but um, it's fantastic to be here, and it's fantastic to see you all there, and it's fantastic to be here to celebrate a new addition, a new look at the world of, of 007 with this fantastic new book, Double or Nothing, from the marvelous Kim. Um, and uh, actually, before uh, uh, we did the event, she sent me an email saying, <coughs> should we coordinate our outfits? <laughs> she was going to wear something appropriate and said she would wear a black velvet dress. I was tempted to wear my um, pale blue terry cloth <laughs> short-legged onesie um, that, that James Bond infamously wore in Goldfinger, but it's at the Menders, the... <laughs> The bullet holes are being sewn up. <laughs> but, so, I mean, Kim, the obvious place to start talking to you is, when did you first become aware of James Bond? Um, well, first of all, hello, everybody. Uh, it's so nice that you're all here. And I'm just going to pour Charlie some water. Thank you. <laughs> I first, uh, well, my oh, first geez. introduction to Bond was, was really when Pierce Brosnan's films made it on the TV. I was too young to see Goldeneye in the cinema. My first cinematic Bond experience was actually Die Another Day, um, for, for better or worse. <laughs> um, worse, uh, I think. <laughs> so uh, so, so how old would you have been? I would have been um, That's under... Me. It's all right. Is that you? All right. Yep. See, this is why we should coordinate, you know. <laughs> maybe the terry cloth would have been better. Um, I would have been under 10, and I remember seeing Brosnan dive off the dam, that being so spectacular and roll off the Millennium Dome, which was such a big deal at the time. You know, the construction took forever, and we did a school trip there, and it was like a weird science museum at the time. We went inside an, an, a gigantic nostril, and that seemed to be sort of the way to celebrate the Millennium. And, and, and but then Bond was on it, so that was better. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I loved his image of Bond, and I used to like dress up as him and play spies and spied on all my neighbors, which luckily they were very tolerant of, and wrote stories about them. I, um, sorry, I'm going to show off now. I was actually in the recording studio where they recorded the music cue of him going down the Thames no, really? and up onto the, to the dome. It, it is one of the most exciting days of yeah. my life. Oh, wow. Because I, 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 I happened to get to know David Arnold, who was the composer of the films then. So, sorry, that I d didn't come here to talk about myself and <laughs> the famous people I've met. <laughs> but when I met Roger Moore... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do tell me about that. <laughs> so, so you became a super, a super fan. And so it, how soon after that would you have gone to see Bond in the cinema? So I went to see Bond in the cinema for my, I think it was my 13th birthday, and my friend Billy, who's here somewhere, um, took me. Um, and uh, it was a really special night, actually. One, because it was my first cinematic Bond, and I was so excited, and all my presents that year were Bond-themed, and I was, I was finally <laughs> old enough to go see Bond. Um, but also because uh, Billy's son had been born that night, but a little bit prematurely, and we weren't sure if he was going to be okay. And the hospital said, you'll have to wait a few hours to, to find out. And so Billy said, let's still go to the cinema, so sort of take, take his mind off it. Um, so we watched the film, and then we came out, and I feel like maybe mobile phones had just been invented. In, in, my, in my memory, anyway, Billy turned his phone on, and we heard that Ethan was okay, and Ethan's actually here tonight. So nice. that, was a, that was a very special way to, to first see uh, Bond on screen. And I loved Die Another Day, and luckily actually, no, none die, of the adults the around me okay. uh, corrected me on that. And I, I feel like half of that film, at least, stands up. No, no the, the, I mean, <laughs> they, all have, they all have a lot going for them. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> no, that one was a good one. But, no, I mean, to, to show my age, the first, the first Bond film I saw in the cinema was Thunderball. Oh, brilliant. Which in, is the first film I actively remember going to see at a cinema. Yeah. I must have seen some Disney or whatever before. But I, I remember everything about the evening going to the cinema. And it, we got, you got a sort of brochure. 
wow. as if it was a premiere with yeah. all photos from the film. And it was just the most exciting thing for me. And Perfect you... for, for kids. There's a yeah. woman being tortured with a cigar <laughs> and an ice cube. There's a, someone pinned to a tree yeah. with a harpoon gun. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> Were you amazed by the underwater sequences? Because that was really new. It was new. Sadly, it was a little dull. Yeah. And you couldn't tell who anyone was. <laughs> Particularly as a child, they gave them sort of different coloured yeah, yeah. frogman outfits, but um, you couldn't see what's going on. And then you cannot have a fight underwater. It's very it's, slow. It's just, yeah. <laughs> boof, like, ooh, <laughs> that really hurt. So there's a lot of cutting of windpipes and bubbles going on. Yeah. But no, I, I just loved everything about it. And I think to this day, I think Thunderball still is the most successful Bond film in terms of ticket sales. Mm. Something like one in three people in America went to see it. So. Wow. But it cemented for me a lifelong love of Bond. Mm. Um, so how soon after watching the films did you get around to the books? Pretty quickly. I think I first read Fleming when I was about 12. And I, I wanted to, I'd always written stories spying on my neighbors, <laughs> writing about their lives. And I wanted to try writing a spy book. And I was talking to my mom about it one day when we were in Camden. And I said, you know, I want to try writing a spy story, but I don't know how to go about it. And mum said, well, try reading one, which is great advice for any writer. And I bought a secondhand copy of From Russia With Love in the pan paperback edition and just fell in love with Ian Fleming's style and his characterization and his dialogue and, and that sense that you were being invited into a secret world. And I read all of the books and then read them all again and again. And did you go back to start and read them in chronological order or did just whatever you could get a hold of at the time? The, fir the way I read them first was in the order I was buying them in. And then I had my full set and, and went back through, which then made a lot more sense. <laughs> well, I mean, From, From Russia With Love was the first book I, I read. I, I came to the books later in life. I mean, I was aware of them. They were always around. You go into Smith's and there'd be a whole shelf of the paperbacks and they'd always be in the second-hand bookshops and in the library. And there were copies knocking around the house and I'd read bits of it, but it was, it was only late when I was in my 20s, which I, I finally came around. And it is a great place to start. Mm. If any of you have not read any of the Fleming books, you really should. And if you're only going to read one, read From Russia With Love. I, I think it's the, in terms of... And they're all great books. They all have something mm. fantastic mm. in them. But I think From Russia With Love is kind of... He put... The, he put everything into that, mm. he put his heart into it. Mm. He, and it's the best written of the books. Because it was at a time, it was his fifth book, and Bond was pretty successful in the UK. Um, not with the critics, but people were buying it. But he really wanted to, it to get to the next level mm. and to the hit in the States. So he really worked hard at that book. And, and he said to himself, if this doesn't work, I'm going to stop. Mm. And he, he basically kills Bond at the end of the book. Um, but the book did well, and they found an antidote to the poison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that book has... Fleming is really interesting with his structures, and, and From Russia With Love has one of my favourite structures. We spend most of, sort of the first third of the novel really with the Russians as they're plotting the sort of downfall of Britain, and their idea is that they'll demoralise Britain and they're thinking about attacking myths of Britain, and they have this discussion at the sort of high levels of Smirsh. Uh, what myths could they deconstruct? And they talk about the, the myth of Scotland Yard and, and Sherlock Holmes and Churchill. And then they say that you know, the Secret Service is one of those great myths of Britain. And is there no, no man of, of great heroic deeds who, who represents the Secret Service who they could bring down? And somebody says, there is a man called James Bond. And they develop this plot to sort of uh, slander him and to uh, kind of tear his life apart. And I really love it because up until that point, I feel like Fleming is creating a myth out of James Bond. I, I think it's sort of baked into the DNA of Bond that he will stand as a symbol for Britain. And he's, and he's remained that. But in From Russia With Love, Fleming almost points to that and says, look, I've created this myth of Britain, and now I'm going to see if I can destroy it over, over 180 pages. Um, but, but luckily there was an antidote, so it was, yes. it was okay in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it is amazing um, how huge a cultural icon mm. Bond has been. And, you know, you're, you're, you're just starting out in, in the world of, uh, of being part of that Bond thing. And, you know, it's incredible that 
you know, when there's a new Bond film out, the media here goes nuts. And mm. even, you know, news night, news at 10, they'll all get a bit giddy <laughs> and dress up as Bond and, and do something about Bond. Uh, and, and, you know, you can dress it up. It's, a, it's fantastic for cultural studies. There is not any area of cultural studies you could, mm. you could get into where you couldn't actually write a paper on James Bond absolutely. in relation to that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think really unusual in that, and it I mean, would be silly to say, oh, Fleming's an underrated writer, but I think he deserves all the credit in the world for creating such an iconic character. I know it's, the films have kind of evolved the character, but I think the character's capacity for evolution is baked into the books because there are the sort of essential ingredients of his character sort of laid out in Casino Royale that are, are fixed and are sort of useful in that an icon can be fixed. But he's also human and he changes book to book and he's affected by what happens to him and he's vulnerable. So he's an icon that can change. And I, I feel like that's right there on the page in Fleming. And then that's a huge gift to the filmmakers because they can keep adapting the character through the decades. Mm. And each, yeah, I mean, each incarnation of Bond represents mm. views of manliness <laughs> in that decade. Right. So, the, and the books very much are, the, are, the, are kind of 1950s view of mm. how to be a, a gentleman, aren't mm. they? Mm. And I, it's interesting looking at them in that uh, sort of post-war context. And, and we often think about that in terms of the, the gender politics of the books. But I also think it's interesting to think about the shadow of World War II in the books. Yes, they're Cold War spy stories, but of course Ian Fleming had been in naval intelligence in the war. And I think you can really see the shadow of the war in the books, whether it's something like the description of the bodies around, or what they think of the, the bodies around Fort Knox, um, which it just, to me, that description is kind of reminiscent of images that had come out of the liberation of concentration camps in World War II, things that soldiers had seen, really the, the sort of shadow of mass mechanized death for the first time. So, there's, there's that fear, but then there's also Fleming giving his readers a taste of air travel and exotic food and going to beautiful sunny places that most people in that time couldn't go to. So he is also offering an escape, um, which I, I, I don't know if anyone returned to Fleming in lockdown, but I was obviously reading it a lot for writing this and I, I felt really grateful to him for that escape in, in, during the pandemic. I mean, you're obviously such a massive fan and no Bond inside out, but how, because there are many massive fans who know Bond inside out, there's probably quite a lot here, <laughs> who would love to be in your position now on stage, having written an official book. So how, how did you transition from fangirl to James Bond author? <laughs> That's so, such a surreal sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it really was like a dream, and it's still kind of, this feels like a dream. This is my favorite building in the world, and I'm here talking about James Bond. <laughs> I might wake up in a minute. <laughs> um, but so the first thing I, I heard was from my agent, um, Sue, who had heard that the Fleming estate were looking for a new author because Anthony Horowitz's tenure was coming to an end, and they were looking for somebody to kind of widen out the James Bond universe and bring in these new double O characters. And they wanted somebody who was a real fan. You know, this is the Fleming's family legacy, so they want somebody who really cares. And my agent heard this and remembered that the, when I just first signed with her and we went for lunch, she asked me, what are your career dreams and ambitions? And I said, oh, well, one day I'd like to write James Bond. <laughs> and I was sort of half joking, um, but not really joking. <laughs> so it's kind of a lesson in, in saying far-fetched things out loud. <laughs> and um, she, uh, she remembered that, and she remembered that I'd actually I tweeted a picture the day Testament, my first novel, came out. I tweeted a picture of it in bookshops next to Anthony Horowitz's Bond novel. <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, one step closer to my dream of writing Bond. And Sue uh, found that tweet and screenshot it, and as I understand it, sent it to the family and said, you know, maybe this is the writer for you. And they invited me to send along some ideas. Um, and I also wanted to send them something just to kind of express how much I love this character. And luckily, um, my mum had kept a school report that I wrote when I was 13. It was like homework, and the homework task was to write about an author you admire, and I'd written about Ian Fleming. And I made this whole booklet, and there were flaps and things that popped out and <laughs> illustrations. So I scanned that, and I sent it along, and I just said, you know, this really would be the dream of a lifetime. Um, and they, they liked Testament, and they liked the ideas, and, and it all grew from that. Amazing. And, and as guys, I know this... I, I don't know... Uh, we couldn't actually hear any of what was said in the introduction because the acoustics were so bad. I don't know how much Diggory said about the book, but just in case you don't know, uh, it is, 
it is looking at the other 00 agents around James Bond. So how much of that, the sort of structure of the books was, was in place and how much were you able to, to bring to that? Well, the only criteria I was given um, was to bring it into the 21st century, bring it into the present day, and to widen out the cast of characters so that we could have other 00 heroes alongside Bond. And that was it. So within that, I was free to imagine who those new characters might be. And the challenge then was, if you're going to write a James Bond novel that doesn't have James Bond on every page, why should the readers care about the new characters? So I thought, well, I'll, I'll have him be missing from the beginning. Sort of, if that's the challenge of the book for the reader, make it the challenge for the characters. James Bond is missing. MI6 don't know if he's been captured or if he's even killed. And these new heroes are trying to find him. So I thought, I'll. I'll kind of put that challenge into the plot itself. And you've got, you've got a lot of, the, of the, the double O world in there. You've got M, you've got Miss Moneypenny, uh, you've got Q and Q Division, you've got Felix Leiter. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about how you kind of tweaked them. Sure. That might be the first time that we've said Felix Leiter's in the book, so scoop everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Felix Leiter's in the book. Wait, I must just tell him the ending. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm glad, actually, that you mentioned Felix Leiter because he was one of my favorite characters to write. Um, he's my husband Nick's favorite character in Bond, so I felt like he had to be there. And I looked at uh, Leiter in the novel. So for those who are fans of the film, there's that strange thing where, where Felix Leiter's always played by, or up until Daniel Craig's era, had been played by different actors, and he's been eaten by sharks, and then he hasn't been eaten by sharks, and he's eaten by sharks again. So in the novels, he is eaten by sharks, and it's one of my... He's half-eaten. He's half-eaten, like loses an arm and a, arm and a leg and a hat. Um, it's one of my favorite scenes. His, his body is delivered to Bond's hotel room, wrapped in, in bandages, and it's just these blood-soaked bandages, with a, with a note that says he disagreed with something that ate him. <laughs> it's one of my favorite Fleming lines. And uh, then he's, he's okay. And, and, and Bond goes off and saves the day and, and gets the pirate treasure and gets the girl, but you don't really find out what happens to Felix. And I was really curious, how did he feel at the end of that novel, several limbs down, and the, the trauma of being eaten by sharks? <laughs> so this, this was my chance to uh, kind of tackle that for his character and to kind of to make him one of the main characters in, in a way instead of one of the side characters. And then, yeah, there's a few other favorites with sort of different twists. So. Moneypenny is now head of the 00 section. I felt like she was very long overdue a promotion. She's now in charge. And then there's a new M. My own version of M is head of MI6. And a Q is now a quantum computer. Uh, uh, that, was, that, that, I thought, was such a great idea. Oh, I loved the you. idea thank you. of a computer called Q who kind of <laughs> yeah. knows everything and, yeah. and, and he even has a way into the heads of one of the... Agents and, and Q sort of goes up against the villain's computer, doesn't he? Yeah. It, she. It, yeah. I don't, I don't know Q's preferred <laughs> they, pronouns. I'll, they. I'll leave that to Q. Um, yeah, well, I was looking into technology used by intelligence organizations, and, and a lot of them are using quantum computing and artificial intelligence to fight terror, so to crunch these massive data sets around terrorist financial transactions. So I was really sort of curious about that, but then there was the question of well, how do you bring that into the novel? So there's one of the characters, 004, Joseph Dryden. He was in special forces in the army. And I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. This all happens in the first few chapters. You learn that he sustained a uh, head injury in Afghanistan, and uh, the Q department have sort of pre presented him with a solution to this, a computer brain interface, which is technology that's being developed at the moment. Uh, it's already in use in some cases, which means that he has a kind of direct link to Q. So it was a way to kind of bring the computer in almost as a character. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's very clear from what you're saying that this is a very contemporary mm. take on, on, on Bond. Um, so, I mean, would you, that side of it obviously feels more like the films mm. than the books, which are, which are written 70 years ago, some of them. So, you know, how did you find that balance between the sort of literary side of Bond and, mm. the, and the cinematic side of Bond and getting, getting the feel for that in the books so that the Bond fans who love the books get that feel of Fleming. Mm. I think it's, it's a challenge because it's impossible to ignore the films. They're in all of our collective unconscious, so you, you can't kind of set them to one side. But what I was thinking about was 
ways to write to what Fleming did while allowing for the, the reader's imaginations, including the film world. So almost trying to, to balance the two. So there are moments in the book which are perhaps more resonant of the films, uh, Moneypenny and, and Bond's relationship in particular, which is sort of perhaps more present in the films than, than some of the books. Um, but then there are also moments where I'm actually directly taking Fleming's lines and taking dialogue that he puts in the mouths of characters to try and bring him in as much as possible. I can't write like Ian Fleming, obviously, but I was thinking about ways our writing might have a shared DNA, particularly because he influenced me so young. So trying to bring in how, how brilliantly he evokes a sense of place, how he has, he has this really sort of uncanny, unsettling imagery. His imagery usually, if you, if you look at Casino Royale, for example, it starts off really beautiful. There's an amazing description of um, uh, clouds like um, paper herrings across the sky. So it starts off really lulling and beautiful. And then as things begin to go wrong and Bond begins to lose, the imagery turns uncanny and unsettling. So we have hands traveling across a card table like pink crabs, eyeballs that look like um, black currants poached in blood. So it becomes really unsettling. So I thought about ways to kind of echo that imagery. And then also his great gift of the point of view. So being able to enter all these different characters' minds, being able to look at Bond from the outside, that was really helpful in, in sort of this this iteration where I'm trying to occupy the, the perspective of multiple heroes. And, I mean, well, talking of the multiple heroes, uh, this is planned trilogy at, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it focuses on three of the double O's. Mm. Are there other double O's introduced in later books, or are you going to concentrate on... Um, the ones you've established so far. I'm looking around to see if anyone's saying, you can't answer that, kid. <laughs> I'm getting a maybe. <laughs> uh, there'll be a red dot appearing between my eyes or something. <laughs> uh, so I have other characters in my mind, um, and they are introduced sort of as and when the plot needs them. Mm. Um, so what was fun for me was when I first began to imagine the characters, I came up with sort of 10 people who might work in the double O section. And then it was thinking, okay, well, who's, who's most useful for the plot uh, in book one? And then in book two, other characters are kind of coming to the fore and, and some receding, um, which is the, the sort of gift of being able to go beyond just the one hero. And I mean, while we're on that, do you want to just very quickly say who the three double O's are? Yeah, sure. So we have kind of three main characters leading the novel. There's double O three, Johanna Harwood, which will be a familiar name to Bond fans. The real life Johanna Harwood co-wrote Dr. No and From Russia With Love. Um, and the I films. kind of, the, the films I should say, <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to sort of, sort of honor the first woman to write Bond and I, I wrote to the real life Johanna Harwood and asked her permission and she was very kind and said yes. So she's named after her, but in the, in the book, 003, uh, she, she starts off actually training as a trauma surgeon. That's kind of her initial plan in life. And then something happens in her life. She's, she's brought to the attention of Money Penny, and she's recruited into the 00 section. And she's somebody, I think of her as, like her main skill almost is adaptability. She is whatever the person across from her needs her to be. Uh, and she's, she has a romantic relationship with Bond, which, which doesn't last. I don't think that's a shock to anyone. Um, <laughs> and uh, she then gets together with 009, Sid Bashir, who has a very um, philosophical mind, is a very sort of strategic thinker, quite different from, from Bond in lots of ways, but Bond is his mentor, so that's a super uncomfortable workplace with their love triangle. And then there's 004, Joseph Dryden, who I mentioned he was in Special Forces before an injury uh, kind of means he can't serve on the front line anymore, which is a really common route for, for spies, I'm told, uh, to go from sort of soldier to spy because those skills are so useful. And he's kind of on a, there's sort of two strands to the novel. We have 003 and 009 and one and 004 and the other, and the two kind of weave together. How, how worried are you that the Daily Mail and the Daily Express? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I probably don't need to say any more. The, the double O agents, we've got a woman. Oh, God. So woke. <laughs> a black gay man and a Muslim. Yeah. I'm going to do a strategic sip. <laughs> but and, uh, it was interesting because you, you were talking at a, um, the, the, the sort of launch party thing mm -hmm. yesterday. And you were saying, but actually, 
and I think it's a, it's a really fantastic point, is that MI6 wants to recruit as many diverse people as possible well, of because course. of where they've got to go in the yeah. world. And, and you said, you know, if they all look like James Bond, it would be a bit of a giveaway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's a limit <laughs> to how many places a white man who went to Eton can go undercover, really. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so when I was coming up with these new Dublin heroes, the first thing I did was look on the MI6 website, and they have these really funny job adverts that say, you know, do you love to travel? Do you speak five languages? <laughs> um, so you can kind of build up a picture of who it is they're after. And, um, you know, of course, they're, they're looking for people from a whole range of backgrounds to, to go undercover all over the world. So that was my first cue. Um, but also I was thinking about the opportunity that I was given to kind of widen out the cast of characters. Because I don't, I don't want to change who James Bond is. I, I love Bond as he is. I want that character. But to be able to bring in new heroes, when I was little and I would play imaginary games, I would play as James Bond because, you know, as fantastic as those female characters are, I didn't want to be rescued. I wanted to do the rescuing. So I imagined I was Bond. And I thought this is an opportunity to create a more kind of inclusive world mm. where more readers can see themselves as the hero. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it's really clever not to sort of create one of them as this is the one who's who's like a sort of ersatz James Bond. Right. You've made them all as different from him uh, as, as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Because anything else is going to seem like a watered-down martini. Yes. You can't do a version of Bond. He's, he's himself. He's so essential. Mm. And, and there's, no, there's no reason to, to either. You know, I think we don't need a pale imitation. I, I was really excited by the opportunity to bring in heroes who hopefully, hopefully people will grow attached to in their own right. And I mean, the, you, you, you have got in a couple of flashback scenes to... Um, to, to Bond mm. himself. And how old is Bond in the book? So he is kind of around the age. So, so Fleming says that at 45, most double O's retire or are dead by that point. So I'm forced to retire. Um, but I kind of have him hovering around that age. So he's at the age where really money penny ought to say to him, stop, this isn't wise anymore. Uh, but he's, he's missing, so she can't tell him that yet. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, for someone like me who's kind of seeped in the world of the, of the books and the whole mythos, I kept having to stop myself from thinking, well, how does that tie in with what you did there? He'd be 100 years old. Yeah. I, have a, I have a whole headcanon of all of the Fleming's books updated. So they, in my mind, they take place in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So I have a sort of weird 90s version of Moonraker um, where there's a neo-Nazi plot instead of a Nazi plot, which actually isn't that far-fetched these days. So I, I've brought it all kind of up in my mind so I could just continue on from Fleming. Well, the, the question that I would always get asked writing about Bond is, you know, A, which is your favourite Bond? I presume for you, is it Pierce Brosnan because that was your first? Yeah. Well, so for me, it's Sean Connery. Um, but then it was kind of, in your books, which, which, of, which mm. of the Bonds is it? Which actor? Did you, did you have that image in your mind, or was he a conglomerate of them all? Yeah, more of a conglomerate. I had Fleming's description mm. in my mind as the sort of, almost like the Bible version. And then depending on the scene I was writing, like if it was a very action-heavy scene, it'd be Daniel Craig running through my <laughs> mind. If it was James Bond walking powerfully, it'd be Sean Connery. <laughs> um, if it was him smiling, it'd be Pierce Brosnan, raising an eyebrow Roger Moore. Um, just, just the eyebrow yeah. from Roger, yes. Uh, brooding Timothy Dalton and um, what, whatever it is that George Lazenby was doing. <laughs> just the eyebrow of Roger Moore. There's a very funny <laughs> story about when um, Roger Moore was filming um, Live and Let Die, his first foray. And in fact, he wrote a really entertaining journal of when he was filming that. It's, it's a really great read. Uh, but when they came to the first big action scene, the, the director, was it Martin Campbell? Well, no, it was, no. We, we'll call him John. <laughs> I should know. Uh, there's people out there going, no, it wasn't him. I know it was. <laughs> anyway, so it says to, says to Roger, um, okay, so the, uh, that's the entrance to the, to the cave over there, so I want you to run over there. So can I, can I just stop you there, John? Uh, I, I won't be running over there. He said, yeah, no, no, it's a chase, so, you know, you've got to get to the cave mouth quickly. He says, yes, but I, I, I won't be running. <laughs> he said, but you've got to. You're, you're being chased. He said, shall I demonstrate? <laughs> and he demonstrated his run to the director. 
And the director said, OK, you'll walk briskly <laughs> over to the cave. <laughs> He does do a lot of brisk walking. He does. He, he, yeah. he never runs. He's, yeah. no, he's no Daniel Craig with the, the yeah, free runner. He can run up a crane, Daniel he, Craig. He, 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 um, was, he was very yeah. embarrassed by his walk. Yeah. <laughs> was it, I'm going to look at David, was it Guy Hamilton, the director? Guy Hamilton, of course it was, yeah. yes. Yeah, it was. I should have asked you I, why I was asking them. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, Guy. No, I won't be doing that, Guy. Um, <laughs> where were we? What were we talking about? Roger Moore. Always. Roger Moore, yes. Well, <laughs> which, which Bond is it? Yes, yeah. and there's bits of all of them. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, the Roger Moore films, because, you know, having grown up with Sean Connery and gone through all that, you know, that was my idea of this very kind of muscular mm. Bond. And then when the Roger Moore films came, started to come out, I was sort of reaching that age where I was thinking, I'm a bit, uh, a bit too grown up for Bond mm. now, as I was getting into being an older teenager. And I think, you know, this isn't James Bond. But actually, going back, I, I, th I think... Some of those Roger Moore films are fantastically entertaining. Absolutely. Just, just pure entertainment and, and, and light comedy as Absolutely. well, which he was yeah. a master of. Yeah, complete master. I used to rush home from school to watch The Saint because I'm a child out of time. <laughs> and I loved The Saint. <laughs> um, and I, I always loved him in that because it suits his lightness, I think, and his debonair touch. But I think he's a brilliant Bond. He's, he's not necessarily my, my, just my personal favorite, but um, I think he's, he's fantastic for... Show, you know, every, every actor brings out a different facet of Bond, and I think what he brings out is that Bond uses a light touch as a survival mechanism, and then beneath that, there's a sort of sometimes a simmering anger that he lets kind of rise to the surface, and then and then clamps back down with his raised eyebrow. Excellently put. <laughs> um, and obviously, in your book, you've got all the elements that are in there, um, including. The villains, and there are sort of, as you said, there's sort of two strands to the story, and there are sort of two strands mm. to the villainy. But you have one character who I guess is is your is your pure Bond villain. So mm. t tell us a little bit about him. Well, so I was thinking um, about you know the, the the villain is hard because Fleming has such iconic villains, and 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 the films have carried that on brilliantly. And this was something that we chatted about when we, we met for the first time last year at the, they do a premiere for the films for the Fleming family and we met then and uh, we went off into a corner with Anthony Horowitz and all <laughs> talked about how the villain is the hardest thing. And I felt like, God, if my 12 year old self could see me now, <laughs> you know, talking to these two writers that I love, <laughs> it's very surreal. Um, but I, I kind of, I looked to Fleming for help. I thought, well, he's, he writes about the, the kind of main threats of his time, whether it's the sort of fear of communism or the fear of the bomb. And so I thought, what are our uh, sort of greatest threats right now? And I felt like our greatest global threat is the climate crisis. So I looked at, you know, how might a, a Bond villain um, kind of represent in, that, in, in a way? How can you take that crisis and put it in a human? So the, the villain's called Sir Bertram Paradise. He's a tech billionaire, and he has a promise that he can halt the climate crisis using geoengineering. And uh, it's up to the double-A section to work out whether his intentions are as, are as pure as he says. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the villains is tricky. I mean, the, the whole thing is tricky because people want it to be the same, mm. but different. Because I always yes. say, oh, that's just another Bond villain. Or it's, mm. you know, so it, and, and trying to get away with the villain, uh, trying to create that villain character that isn't, uh, isn't kind of deformed in some mm. way or mm. scarred or yeah. disfigured. And, and to, it, 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 yeah, I mean, was that one of the reasons why you added in the extra layer of the villainy around him? So I, I wanted to have these two strands, and I thought I'll, I'll have the 003 and 009 facing one threat and 004 facing another, and then as, as the book goes on, you, you wonder if, if they're sort of intertwined. And it certainly, in, in one way, takes the pressure off one villain to hold it yeah. all. Um, but I also love um, that sort of Russian doll structure of you don't quite know who the bad guy is. And I, I think some of that goes back to Cold War spy thrillers, that sense of paranoia and insecurity and not knowing quite where the source of evil is. So I, I, I think I was inspired by that. Um, and I also was looking at kind of who are our villains today. Mm. So, so the villain in the other strand is a kind of shadowy private military organization, um, which felt to me just sort of not taken from the headlines, but certainly something that we're seeing more and more in conflict. So that yeah. seems kind of like useful to explore. A high-class mercenary. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, I, I sense you, don't, you, you can't say or don't want to say too much about the other books, but are they going to be a sort of spectre ongoing 
thing or are they dealt with in this one? So I think I can say that the, because it's been conceived as a trilogy, which is a kind of gift for me as a writer because I can think about the long arc of these characters. And also for me, I was always really curious, well, what happens next? So you bring down the one guy, what about the whole organization? Um, so it's a chance for me to kind of, hopefully you'll finish the book with some questions and then books two and three can kind of answer those questions. I was also thinking about the kind of ways to make the villain human. You, you don't want them to seem cartoonish. And I was talking to a um, really fantastic uh, editor at the Fleming Estate, Phoebe, about the, the problem of cartoonish villains, that so, so many of our villains in our real modern world are very cartoonish and oh, are very yeah. flat and their, and their motifs are very shallow. Well, they've all modelled themselves on Bond villains. It would seem. You know, <laughs> Donald Trump is, is just, got every, you know, he's got a mad hairstyle. Yeah, yeah. He's a strange colour. Yeah. He's yeah. got his huge Bond villain yeah. lair that yeah. he, pl he plays golf in. Yeah, he's I always mean, playing golf. He yeah. is, I mean, he's Goldfinger yeah. in a wig, isn't he? Yeah. Uh... Completely. He's stealing nuclear codes. He's yeah. all over it. So, so how, do you, how do you kind of make it interesting? Uh, how do you get into that person's mind uh, when, our, when our models today are quite cartoonish? And I was actually able to speak to somebody um, who works for the government, de-radicalizing potential uh, people who, who might be showing tendencies towards violent extremism. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a really useful conversation to just to kind of get beyond that flat idea and into the human, you know, what, what makes somebody that angry? What makes somebody that scared? And to, to be able to get into the psychology really helped me with writing the villains in the book. Yeah, well, you've done a terrific job. Um, now, you mentioned last night, there's something I wanted to talk about, and going back to <coughs> how excited it was for me to be when they were recording the the Die Another Day piece. Fantastic, the full orchestra mm. blasting away. Um, is that you listen to music, you listen to the Bond music yeah. when you write, which is exactly what I did when oh, I really? started writing the Young Bond books, was uh -huh. to get myself into the right mindset yeah. at the yeah. start of the day. I created a, a James Bond playlist with mm. all the big themes, and I, 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 I did already have a big collection of Bond soundtrack mm. music, because I love John Barry. Yeah. So um, it was really interesting that you did exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, like I was saying earlier, you can't ignore the films because they're so sort of deep within the subconscious. And so I felt like there's no point trying to ignore them, um, just to literally bring it into the room through the music because just listening to the theme immediately, well, for me, like this is the most I've giggled while writing ever. <laughs> you know, the theme starts playing and I write James Bond and I just start laughing to myself. Um, and certain songs are kind of good for different moments um, because there are some beautiful love songs. Like nobody does it better. It's just such a beautiful love song. Um, and then, and then you know, Tom Jones blasting it out and Shirley Bassey. And so there, also you get your good swelling epic moments. So anytime I'm finding it a bit tricky as well, I, I feel like the music always comes to my rescue. Very much so. You know, uh, it, because I mean, did you? Uh, when I started, I, I, I did. You know, first of all, say brilliant. What a fantastic job to be offered. And then you sit down and you think, well, can I pull it off? Can I write? <laughs> As you said, I didn't want to write like Ian Fleming and try and copy his style, but mm. it, I, it needed to feel like James Bond. So mm. I sort of picked a bit in the story that I knew was going to happen that was kind of the most James Bondy bit mm. Mm. and put the music on and, and, and did it. So did you have yeah. that moment of thinking, how did you prove to yourself yeah. that you could do that? That it might work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the first sentence was really daunting. It was Fleming so good at first sentences and the opening line of Casino Royale, the sentence, smoke and sweat of the casino and nauseating at three in the morning. That's my favorite opening line ever. Um, so it was, that was daunting. And I actually, I wrote what is the opening line in the book and then I deleted it and then I wrote 10 other opening lines and then I went back to the first one, <laughs> decided, okay, maybe, maybe that's good enough. Um, but it, when did it feel like it was working? There's a flashback moment a few chapters in where um, it's in Moneypenny's memory and she remembers Bond coming into the office and it's kind of halfway between a, a memory and her imagining if he was to suddenly turn up again because he's been missing for quite a while. What would it be like if he were to suddenly turn up again? And that was when almost fantasy shuddered into reality and I realized I am writing James Bond and I've got a few thousand words on the page and maybe it'll be okay. But you couldn't write the iconic line, the name's Bond, James. <laughs> Were you tempted to do the name's Harwood, Joanna Harwood? <laughs> Just a troll. 
Uh, no, nobody, yeah, nobody says it. I realized that yesterday. Um, somebody asked me, and I realized, no, nobody says it. In the, so maybe I'll, I'll save it if, if he turns up again. Maybe I'll save it for them. I managed to get it in into my young Bond book because it, <laughs> it starts with his, his first day at Eton. And one of the masters says, who are you? <laughs> the name's Bond, sir. <laughs> James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Fleming... I, I think one of the reasons his books are so, are, are so great is that he put his own passions into it. The things that he loved doing or that he was interested in that he wanted to find out about. And he mm. loved skiing and he loved cars and yeah. smoking and drinking and women. Um, <laughs> Were, were there any of your passions that you brought specifically to the book of that's what I want to write about because that's what I love? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the places in the book, uh, places that I really love. So the Barbican features significantly in the novel. Um, and <laughs> is, the, is the British Library going to be in the next one? Uh, well, that would be telling. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Um, <laughs> so the Barbican's like one of my favorite buildings. And um, I, I thought it'd be fun to bring it in despite Ian Fleming hating modernism, I thought it'd be fun to bring in as a kind of icon of post-war London because Bond himself is an icon of post-war London and also just because I really love the Barbican. And I was lucky that the Flemings know somebody who lives there and was able to give me a sort of behind the scenes tour, you know, this is what the car park is like, this is what the laundrette is like, the things that you don't always get to see, um, which helped me kind of bring it to life. So a lot of it was at places, but you know, particularly growing up in London, getting to write about the places that I love. Um, and then also looking at, so I was writing it in lockdowns, and it's, it's hard to write a, a jet-setting escapist novel it, it just in one room. Uh, but in a way, it kind of set me free. Uh, so I looked at um, Ian Fleming's travel book, Thrilling Cities, where had he written about that I have also been and loved. So Berlin sort of came to the fore as a city I really love. Um, so really, it was sort of bringing in, in those, those things that I've always fantasized. You know, <coughs> Every time I go to Berlin in the past, I've thought, oh, if, if Bond was here, what would happen? And I've, and I've plotted it all out. So there was a chance to kind of put that on the page. And obviously, one of the other things that Fleming loved was, was cars. Yes. He loved driving big, powerful cars. Um, and there's a lot of car stuff in the book, yeah. including, I thought it was pronounced Alpine, but it's an Alpine, is it? I believe so, yes. Uh, fact checkers in the corner. <laughs> uh, yes, Al the Alpine is the new kind of Bond uh, car. I shouldn't say Bond car, it's Harvard's car. It's the new 003 car in the book. Uh, and it was, it was really exciting to um, kind of get to write about it. I, I've never driven in a sports car in my life, so I said, you know, in order for this to be like a really authentic why, writing Why process, have you never driven a sports car? Well, where have people been Go in on, my life with it. a sports car? Because I can't drive. <laughs> Uh, which is my terrible confession. Well, I'm very similar. I didn't learn to drive till I was in my late 30s. Yeah. And again, I had to... Uh, I mean, I, I did quite get into cars writing the books because mm. I had to kind of look into it. But, yeah. it, you know, it's one of those things... Uh, you have to fake it. Yeah, yeah, completely. <laughs> but you did get yeah. driven in the, in the car. Well, if you can't drive, a race car driver will take you out, which is even better, I think. So we, we went out in the Alpine in Edinburgh, and uh, for those who don't know Edinburgh, you know, the old town is like all these streets doing this and cobbles, and it's a really low down car, so like bumping over the cobbles. And I was thinking, well, this is, you know, it's really beautiful, but it's kind of a bit painful, you know? <laughs> and then we got out of the city center, and the driver just floored it without telling me. <laughs> and I left my spine several city blocks back, but it was amazing, <laughs> it was so much fun. <laughs> I was like, can we do that again, please? So I was writing notes while he was driving me around, but I couldn't tell him what it was. I was it was still a secret at that point. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone. So, um, but he'd been told I was a, a VIP, <laughs> and he asked what I did, and I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm writing a, a, a book about cars. I thought, that's a good cover for why I'm making all these notes. And then he turns to me and said, but you just told me you can't drive. <laughs> yes is the world's worst cover, but it's what I'm sticking to. <laughs> you, you would make a useless secret agent. I really would. I, I was saying to him, if you were in a mountain at night being chased in this car, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> and you came off the road and came down the side yeah, of the mountain, yeah. and there was an avalanche People were shooting you. at you. <laughs> yeah. And you had to get out and ski backwards. Yeah, How and would you that only work? had a canoe. Yeah. But, but again, you were saying yesterday that there was, um, in terms of gadgetizing the yeah. car, there was a writer's gift to you. Yeah, so I spoke to the Seb, the managing director at Alpine, who was so helpful and kind of talked me through the design of the car. And he said, if I'm right, that there were 
five buttons, these silver buttons, and they realized as they were designing it that the fifth button was kind of obsolete, like the purpose they didn't really need anymore. But, but five was more aesthetically pleasing, so they, they kept it, but that meant there was just one button in the car that didn't do anything, which to me was like such <laughs> a gift. You know, what would Q Branch do with a, with a button that didn't do anything? Uh, so I had a lot of fun um, kind of Did doing you go that. through lots of options? I went through lots of options. I had a lot of help um, from my brother-in-law, who um, I think is a spy. Uh, he might not be, <laughs> but I think he is. Um, but uh, he works for government and was able to kind of talk me through some very cool things that the MOG have. Excellent. Um, <laughs> there, there, I mean, there is a huge amount that I would love to talk to you about, but um, we are running short on time, so it would be great to throw it open to the audience to anything that you would like to ask about. Uh, there's a guy at the back, right back there. There's a microphone on its way to you. Um. Hello, Kim. Uh, Hello. Could you name one thing you enjoyed about writing Double or Nothing? Just one thing. <laughs> oh, that's a challenge. Um, writing the dialogue. I really love writing dialogue. And um, in my other novels, my novels that aren't James Bond, sometimes my editor will, will write in the margins. Uh, uh, next to the dialogue, is this a bit too James Bond? <laughs> because I, I really love one-liners. Um, and this was an opportunity for me to have n no holes barred, all the one-liners I, I want in the world. So I really enjoyed writing the dialogue. And also, dialogue is where you get two characters in relationship with each other working through conflict. And that's the kind of crunchy scene I love to write. Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting when you read the... Um <clears throat> the Fleming books is that Bond doesn't really do one-liners, does he? Very few. But but they but that sort of voice of Bond and mm. that that sort of thing comes through in Fleming's yeah. narration, and that's Absolutely. where the sort of dark humour yeah, comes. Yeah, and that in, kind of I wry, guess. laconic yes. voice. Yeah, absolutely. Which is which is really interesting that when they did the films, they kind of picked up on mm. on the Fleming side of things and put that yeah, into yeah. into. The and character. there's that story with the with the filmmaking of Dr. No that, that it was only sort of once they put a score to it that they realized it was funny. Um, <laughs> you know, the bit where he beats the tarantula with the shoe and they did that boom, 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 and then everybody laughed in, in the cutting room and they thought, oh, maybe we have a comedy on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was, there must be some more questions. There's one over yeah. here. If, uh, I don't know whether you've uh, talked about having it filmed or not, but if it was, who would you see playing your 007? Ooh. You know, I've never thought about that, which seems absurd now. Um, it's almost impossible to say because the one I have in my mind, as we were talking about earlier, is so um, sort of inflected with Fleming's bond that there isn't an actor who I could see would fit my imagination. I think also, I mean, obviously it's a, like a national hobby speculating about who will play Bond next, but for me, I'm, I'm still kind of in mourning for Daniel Craig, so I've, I think my imagination hasn't, <laughs> hasn't gone that far yet. I'm sorry, that's, that's a, not a very complete answer. Did you have, uh, for your young Bond, were there any sort of child actors in mind? No, no, I mean, that, that's, that's the really tricky thing, mm. is you'll never really be able to find a child actor who can, yeah. who is good enough and experienced enough to, to embody mm. someone like James Bond, and mm. it works so much better as, as a book. And mm. the interesting thing is that, you know, I think kids a lot of the time would rather go and see an adult James Bond anyway. Yeah. Because um, yeah. he can do all those things yeah. that kids can't do. Yeah, gets the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Thank next? You. Well, we, ha we have a, an online question from all the way from Portland, Oregon. Jim Turner asks, oh, well, says first, Kim, congratulations. One down, two to go. And then, <laughs> then asks, uh, if Ian Fleming were in your chair and you were in the audience, um, what question would you put to him? Oh, well, oh. well, first of all, hello, American Jim. That's my family friend. Hi, American Jim. <laughs> um, what would I ask Ian Fleming if I could ask him anything? Uh, that's a very good question. I think I'd ask him if James Bond is capable of happiness. <laughs> what would you ask him? 
I'd ask him if he could ever forgive me for, <laughs> for writing the young Bond books. <laughs> Because he would have hated the idea. I mean, no. <laughs> I tried to keep it to the spirit of, of Bond and, and Fleming, but the very idea for him of James Bond as a child being this sort of, uh, on the fringes of being a, a secret agent, um, it, it just, you know, he would have hated it. You know, and he said often that he never even intended James Bond to be a heroic character. Mm. He found him a fascinating character, but he was, you know, a very conflicted character. He's, he's a hired assassin after all and he was appalled that people were sort of mm, glamorizing eight-year-old yeah. girls <laughs> were pretending to be James Bond <laughs> <laughs> um, and he and he rather disastrously tried to sort of redress the balance in the spy who loved me um, of, of trying to show Bond making mistakes and cocking up and, mm. and going wrong to try and say oh he's not this great guy mm. Um, and he also was trying to never try and please the critics and <laughs> address things for them. So he told the book through the eyes of, of this female character. And, you know, Fleming was an amazing writer. He wrote fantastically well about mm. places, as we've discussed, about action. He was an, a, a brilliant action writer, and it's very, very difficult writing action. Mm. And he wrote very well about, about things, cars, guns, gadgets. When he wrote about relationships and women, it was a slightly, he, uh, uh, you know, he, 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 was, he was such a strange man himself that I think a lot of that <laughs> came through in, in some of his, of his writing. Mm. And the idea that he thought that he could write sympathetically and properly through the eyes of a woman was, I think he bit off more than he could chew there. Mm. And Although reading that one, I remember the first time I read The Spy You Love Me, the first, so it's got this really interesting structure. Um, all narrated by the, the leading lady, and the first section is about her sort of teenage years, early relationships with boys, and going, trying to go into a sort of career in journalism and smashing up against the glass ceiling in 60s London. And those descriptions of the early relationships with boys and, and, and boys saying to her, why can't you just be a sport about it? <laughs> and then, you know, leaving her alone to have an abortion, it's, it's pretty radical for, for a writer at that time to be empathizing into that. And, yeah. You know, I remember reading that as a teenager and thinking he's, a lot of this still resonates with me in the 2000s, which is sad, but, uh, you know, he was, he was kind of on the money with, with a, quite a bit of it, I think. But that's not what you really want from a James Bond book. <laughs> yeah, it's maybe not what you're going to Bond for. <laughs> and, and um, yeah, he stopped it from being repeated publishing, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I would love to see that as an adaptation. I did a really fun podcast that you should watch out for. Um, I think they're releasing the episode soon called Build a Bond, where you get to like fantasy cast your own Bond film. And my idea was that The Spy Who Loved Me was adapted, and it was adapted as the first ever Bond film. So it's a bit of an older <laughs> Bond, because it's a later book. And I thought Cary Grant would have made a lovely, older, slightly weary Bond. And then Audrey Hepburn. I won't tell you more. That, this is a spoiler. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> but it, it was great fun doing that. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? There's one down here. Was there another one there? Yeah. No, that's fine if you're ready to go. Me? Oh, sorry. Sorry. God. Um, so you both sort of mentioned music and the creative process. Is there like a particular song that you would associate with your Bond book? Ooh. Hmm, that's a good question. It's, I mean, it's hard to, to, to think beyond the Bond themes because that's the ones that I... <laughs> listen to while writing it um, but of those I think nobody does it better is one that comes to mind because double or nothing kind of centers on um, in some ways the relationship between um, Bond and, and Harwood and Bashir and I've always thought nobody does it better as a beautiful love song but also a very sad love song because you get the sense that the speaker would really like someone else to do it better so they could move <laughs> on. Um, so that, that one kind of comes to mind in that, in that love triangle. Um, and then uh, Diamonds Are Forever also because I think it, it kind of speaks to, um, the, again, that sort of tr like the tragic appeal of, of Bond, and, and also how he's often mirrored in the villains as well, which is something I played around with in this. Uh, there's a guy down the front yeah. here. So I'd just wait for the mic, just so that our online um, people can hear you. You um, were talking about the cars and having to figure yourself into the mindset where you could drive a sports car so brilliantly <laughs> and know all about that. I just wonder, obviously in Bond there's a lot of violence, 
How did you cope with writing that with your sort of modern sensibility? <laughs> Violence is something she's very good at. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've seen Kim in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, yeah, that's a good question. I've always really loved writing fight scenes, and um, one of the early readers of the book was kind of worried that I'm, I might have sort of sadistic tendencies, uh, which would be very Fleming. Um, I, I've always, I think probably because of growing up reading Fleming and, and watching the Bond films and, um, you know, growing up loving uh, also things like Die Hard and, you know, Indiana Jones and like all the action classics and always loved writing that. Um, but it's, when you're trying to get it into the page, obviously you, you don't have the sort of cinematic aspect. So it was also about mapping it onto the character's emotional experiences and where they are, you know, their motives for, you know, when you, when you think about a double O, why do they put themselves in this position? Why are they prepared to kind of give their body over for this abuse? And in lots of ways, James Bond's body sort of represents Britain, and why is he prepared to give it over in that way? And, and Fleming, there's a moment in uh, From Russia With Love where, where Bond thinks of himself as being pimped out for Britain, and he's a little bit uncomfortable about it. Um, so I also kind of looked to his writing and how he, how he thought about the body and its uses to yeah, write those scenes. I, I mean, the, 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 the violence in the books is, is very different to the films. It, it mm. is, it's painful. Mm. It hurts him. It hurts other people. He doesn't enjoy doing it. He yeah. has to do it. Um, and, and it's written very well. It's mm. not like, hey, let's have a great fun punch-up. <laughs> yeah. um, it's not Roger Moore violence. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, and the other thing is, of course, Fleming him, himself is the same as us. In the end, as a writer, it boils down to you're sitting alone in a room with a keyboard and you make it all up. You, know? <laughs> you don't have to go out and kill people. <laughs> but you can project yourself <laughs> into that mindset. I mean, uh, Fleming was lucky enough to have one of the nicest writing rooms in the world. He would go out yeah. to his house he built in Jamaica, Golden Iron would sit at his typewriter and work through his, what he had to write every day and mm. go for a swim on his private reef, have a big cocktail and have dinner. Sounds good. It's an amazing <laughs> lifestyle. I'm waiting yes. for someone to deliver the villa at some point. I think it's coming, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Book two, maybe. <laughs> There's one here, yeah, it's come straight to you. Was it easy to write vices for the new characters? Because we all know that mm. Bond has several um, what, either what are they, or was it easy enough to write, write them into the book? Oh, that's a really good question. I think it ties into what makes them a double O. So, Bond enjoys the luxuries of life as a way to efface the memory of pain and death, Fleming writes. And I, I, I thought about that with these characters. What do they do to kind of survive and to get through what they're experiencing, and so for, for Harwood, she does enjoy the, the sort of luxuries of life like Bond does. Um, Bashir, I think, takes comfort in his mind, in, in being analytical. Um, and Dryden, it was really interesting to write Dryden's character because as a, as a special forces soldier, he'd always been able to rely on his body, you know, to sort of live as a warrior, and then the injury that he sustains in Afghanistan really changes that, and, he's, and he needs the help of Q Branch um, to sort of uh, keep operating and to keep being in the field. And so he has a changing relationship with his body through the book. And the, his sort of coping mechanisms for that were, were really fun to write. And, and particularly how he relied on people and what happened when those people let him down, um, when he had to become self-reliant. So that was, uh, that was sort of really kind of crunchy to explore in the writing. Yes, I mean, it's tricky because Fleming famously had a lot of vices and he, mm. wasn't, uh, he wasn't shy about talking about them, you know. <laughs> and as you say, he said, the same as Bond, it's what made life worth living for him. Mm. And that's what adds a real rich vein into the, into the Fleming books, is, yeah. is that side of, of, um, of Fleming and becomes that side of Bond. Mm. And, you know, much as I have loved all the continuation books that have been written by Sebastian Folks onwards. Um, if anything, I would say that they're all slightly too nice people <laughs> <laughs> to be able to come up with a, that real... Because, you know, there are, there are strange, very dark, twisted things that happen in, in the books. Mm. Mm. And I, I missed that in some of the 
Mm. Some of those, I mean, great, great as those books are. Yes. You um, talked about the cars and the vices, and but we all know uh, that the style, like Bond's clothes, his mm. watch, yeah. you know, those things are really important. Yeah. Did you choose any particular items for your mm. 00s to be wearing, or like, do they have a piece of jewelry, a watch, or something that mm. is like their version of Bond's sort of iconic pieces of style? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted the um, the female characters in the in the book, so uh, Harwood and, and Moneypenny in particular. I wanted them to. I had this idea that they would have watches designed by women. I thought it was a nice way to kind of use their characters to put women-led design right sort of up front and center. And then I spent sort of a day looking for female watch designers, and it's a very kind of male-dominated industry. But I did find uh, some really amazing designers. So um, Harwood's watch is um, a Hermes watch designed by Nina Ditzel. It's beautiful ceramic uh, watch face. And, and if they would like to sponsor me at all, or <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could wear that watch. I could wear the hell out of that watch. <laughs> um, so I enjoyed writing about that. And, and again, my love of modernism. Um, I gave uh, Harwood all the Charlotte Perriand jewelry that I would love to wear. Um, but for Dryden, um, his watch is part of what kind of allows him to, to sort of speak to Q in a sense. Um, so I was looking for technological watches. I went for a Garmin Mark Commander, which I was told was kind of favored by special forces. So it was, it was really fun researching that. And I had, a, I had a great day. I was taken to Sotheby's to look at their watch collection. And they showed me their Rolexes. And they le like let me hold them. And then while I was looking, I said to them, how much is this worth? And they told me the number, and my hands were suddenly so sweaty. <laughs> I said, I'll just put this here. <laughs> and that, that was really great fun. Thank you. They're coming thick and fast now. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, Double O Nothing's a wonderful Fleming-esque title. Thank you. Um, how difficult and at what stage did you arrive at it? Well, I feel lucky because it, it sort of wasn't difficult. It was the first title I wanted. It kind of came to me through the villain. The, the, I don't think this is a spoiler to say because you learn quite early on that the, the villain really enjoys gambling. Um, and so sort of double O nothing came to me as a phrase. And I wanted some way to get double O into the title. Um, so it, it kind of came to me through that. And it's, it's something that drives the villain and drives the story. And, and then I was just really fortunate that everyone else liked it so I could keep it. <laughs> No, I mean, Fleming did come up with such amazing yeah. archetypal titles. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, you always think, well, it must have come easily to him, but he had notebooks full of alternative titles. Mm. And I was very pleased, because I, on all my young Bond books, I went through about 10 different titles on each book. So I was pleased to see that, that Fleming didn't always get it right mm. first time. The, the original title that he really fought to keep for um, Live and Let Die, he really wanted to call it The Undertaker's Wind. <laughs> <laughs> and for someone who, who was kind of tuned to, <laughs> to the language, you think, did you not spot how that could be misinterpreted here? <laughs> you just picture a big fat undertaker leaning over a coffee <laughs> with a boil on his ass, letting off a real stinker. <laughs> Where are we going? Uh, <laughs> wave your hand and speak, whoever has the mic. I think Great. we have a mic next to this gentleman. Oh, and at the back. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, hi, Kim. Hi, Charlie. Um, I think Bond is in very safe hands. Um, you mentioned drafting and redrafting your opening line, and I wondered, during the process, um, whether you asked for or wanted any feedback on the chapters as you were going along, or did you just write the whole thing from beginning to end and then get the feedback? Um, well, I, I, I have a sort of very restricted pool of readers for early on. Um, I feel like when you're writing a novel, the more you write the novel, the more the novel tells you what it wants to be. So in those early stages, it's quite a delicate thing, and you're trying to listen out for it speaking in your mind. So for me, anyway, it's important not to get too many voices involved. Um, but with the early chapters, going back to what we were saying earlier about that sort of initial, can I do this, fear, the early chapters I read aloud to family members uh, which I found helpful, and it's very nice for them to be patient and listen, because <laughs> uh, I'm sure that there were lots of kind of rambling sentences. But pace seemed really important, and this was my first time writing a, a thriller, and really there's no bigger stage to learn on. So it, reading it aloud to people and getting a sense of that pace was really helpful. And then, you know, eventually sharing it with the Fleming family, that was a really 
daunting moment, but really special to be able to talk to them about it and kind of talk about ideas and the direction of the story. I, you know, I really valued that sort of collaborative nature of the work. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, my experience is, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Ken, it, it would be lovely to work with the family and the estate, and, and literary estates can be a nightmare to have dealings with, but IFP is a marvellous organisation, and I'm not only saying that because they're all here. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it was understood from the start, and it sounds exactly, the, well, it would have been exactly the same with you, Kim, that once I'd presented my case, and we talked through the ideas and how it would work, then left us to it, yeah. to get on with it and write it. It was understood that if when I finished the book and I presented it, they hated it, then mm. would never see the light of day. <laughs> Well, I could republish it as a, <laughs> under a different, different yeah. come up with a different secret agent. Yeah, but, Jimmy Pond was yeah. going down to school one day. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, no, it wasn't a case of having to submit every chapter. Yeah. And, because, you know, as a writer, you, as Kim was saying, you've got to get it right for yourself first yeah. and to be happy with it. And really, until you've done your first draft, you don't know what it is you've got. Mm. Uh, yes? Yes, I, I, I wanted to ask, um, you said you first read the books in the sort of early 2000s, is that about, about uh, right? You're making me do maths now, yes that would be about right. Yeah, yeah. I mean I read them in the 70s and I took them as just the great adventures they were, mm. but reading them later on in life, there are moments in there, the morals and the manners that make, you, make me wince, mm. you know, that I didn't really notice the time because life has moved on and mm. things have changed. Mm. How did you feel about the aspect of Fleming, reading them in the 2000s? Did it's a good question. I think, I, you know, as you say, you read them, the context you're reading in them in matters. So I was aware that I was reading them decades after they'd been written and that in some ways I loved them for their style and I loved them for what they taught me about history because they're, incredible, not only reflections of their time, because reflection sounds like a passive word, they also shaped their time because they were so culturally important. So yes, of course, um, some of our ideas have changed since then, but for me, I was always fascinated with, with history growing up and it felt like this, this window into the past um, that, that Fleming was kind of inviting me into. Then the whole thing has that flavor, I think. You know, the, there's that author's note at the beginning of From Russia With Love where he says, oh, not that it matters, but Smirch is a real organization, and this is their address. And I just found that so kind of exciting, this idea that had I been there then, I, and I'm sure he was sort of out of date and it wasn't the right address perhaps, but I, I loved that idea that I could have walked down that street in Russia and knocked on the door and, and there would be Colonel Kleb. Yeah. You know, no, I mean, he, he, was, at me. he was very proud of how factual he had made that opening section. Yeah. And it, it was largely based on information that had come from a... They weren't called. K I can never remember what initials they're ever called at any one time. A KGB defector would call yeah. them that, um, and and it was all based on that. And as you say, he said this is all true. Yeah. And somebody then did go and to the address, and did it they? wasn't the headquarters. Mm. The, the the defector had made it all yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was all lies. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because it feels. Yeah. It feels right. But Absolutely. yeah, I mean, you know, the interesting, you know, it is the, those books were written in, in the fifties, and. Attitudes have changed, times have changed, but even at the time, Fleming was, he was trying to um, make some points and, and push people's buttons. And in some ways, he felt that what he was doing was being quite progressive in the attitudes towards women. I was trying to find the specific quote earlier and I couldn't find it, but it was that idea that, that everything was so dull and, and formalized in the 1950s, particularly how you would go about uh, wooing, courting a woman, and this huge long process of taking them out to dinner and meeting the parents and, 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 and going through all this stuff till eventually, five years later, you can marry them and finally be able to go to bed with them. <laughs> and he was saying, if you've got a young man and a young woman and they both want to go to bed with each other, they should just be able to do that. Get on with it. Cut to the chase. Be open and honest about it. And it's interesting because the books were written in the 50s at the same time as Playboy magazine was launching. And again, that was sort of like James Bond. It was how to be a gentleman in the modern world. 
uh, and how to be able to talk about sex and and all the other stuff that you have in Playboy about you know how to order meals and talk to waiters and what wine to buy and all that you know how to be a Playboy <laughs> and it was also the time of the angry young men and if you look at those mm. plays a lot of that was about men shouting at women because you weren't allowed to do that before and this was seen as being terribly modern um, mm. obviously it's not <laughs> but you know at the time I think I think he was feeling that he was being progressive and, and was saying these truths that mm. needed to be said and particularly in his female characters I think for people who haven't read the novels or maybe know the, the, the films m more than the novels it's easy to forget that that was something that he that I, I think he kind of brought to the spy genre and that he revolutionized in the genre that the female characters aren't um, a prize to be won at the end of a quest. They are rounded characters with their own agency and their own missions. If you look at somebody like Garla Brand, who's, who's a policewoman, she's, she's undercover. It's her mission. She's been on this mission for a year and then Bond arrives and she thinks, oh great, here comes this double O, you know, with his, with his smile and knowing a few languages and fancy pistol tricks, but what use is that going to be to me? So he's often kind of joining women actually on, on their mission. And we talked earlier about um, Vivian Michelle and the Spy You Love Me, he's a journalist. He has a lot of these very professional women uh, trying to make it in that world. And, and to him, I think they're, they're just as important characters as Bond is. Yeah, and, and Fleming himself was, was, was attractive to strong, independent, mm. athletic women. And, you know, he didn't, he wanted to get away from the sort of simpering yeah. image of the 1950s woman and, and sort of thousands of layers of petticoats and <laughs> polishing the stove. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> he had no interest in that. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and so, you know, it's an endless debate, you know. Mm. Was Ian Fleming a misogynist? Is James Bond a misogynist? I think it's a lot more complex and complicated. Mm. And, you know, you could write books about it. And in fact, people have written <laughs> yeah. hundreds. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know you s started before the Bond project came into your life with a plan for a series of novels, mm. and you had more than one in your mind. <laughs> uh, suddenly, this opportunity appears like a bombshell that's thrown all your plans out the window. <laughs> How have you responded to this change in your artistic career mm. and it must have been quite an effort. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, I, in some ways I feel like I've had to learn a whole new way of writing or a whole new creative process. Um, my, my first novel, Testament, took me uh, seven years to write from start to finish. My, my next literary novel, which is out um, in February, A Wild and True Relation, from start to finish, that will have taken 14 years, obviously with other things in between. Um, and, and so the next one in the trilogy is what? Uh, 2039? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I think the suspense is good, you know, <laughs> build the tension. Um, so I was trying to learn a new way to write. I was thinking about how Fleming wrote them in three months in a villa, um, trying to sort of emulate that, that pace and that pith. Um, and also thinking about what's the difference between um, a literary novel and a, and a thriller. In some ways, I think genre categories are kind of a a marketing construction. Um, they don't sort of matter all that much, but I was trying to sort of get to the root of what, is there a difference kind of structurally? And it came to me that, that for me anyway, I think often with a, a novel that's called literary, the goal in mind for the character is quite abstract. It might be a sense of belonging or finding a sense of identity or working out what home means to them. And it, it perhaps isn't a kind of tangible object Whereas often in a thriller, you have a kind of tangible object, a sort of MacGuffin that the, that the characters are after, and then you hang on that object, the character's uh, motifs and emotions and inner life. So all of that is still there, but it's sort of hooked onto something perhaps a bit more physical. So I think that the change really was kind of thinking differently about how I write and sort of learning a new process. Did you want to go to an online question? Yeah, we have one, one little online question from Julian Digby. Um, Kim, it looks like you're wearing a bullet necklace. <laughs> that is an eagle eye. Well uh, done. If, well, they can see uh, the, the, the clothes <laughs> on the camera. Um, any significance? Yes, um, this is a bullet with my name on it, because if you have it, it can't hit you. <laughs> That's my theory. <laughs> uh, so uh, this was an 18th birthday present, and I felt like 
if there was ever an occasion to wear it, it was this one. So uh, thank you for noticing, Julian. <laughs> uh, how much longer have we got? How many more questions uh, can we take? Any last one question and then we... One last question. Who's the most keen? Oh, it's him. He's just grabbed it. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like your book is going in a new direction from the rest of the continuation novels. Mm. Is that to attract a younger audience of readers or is it to expand the universe like we see with the Marvel novels? Mm. And how has that influenced your writing? Oh, good question. I, I, I'd say more the second one. Um, we, we did, I, I kind of thought about it in terms of the MCU, you know, a wider universe. I think in, in lots of ways, what Marvel has done on screen is, and what they already do in the comic books, is a sort of modern version of Greek mythology, perhaps the closest thing we have to that with these vast sprawling characters and they've, they all have these intimate relationships with each other and you can bring any forward at, at one time. And in many ways that's the antithesis of a traditional James Bond story where we have this, this quest with, with one figure at the front of it and you always wonder, you know, couldn't he call back up when he's like in real trouble? Uh, but but there's seemingly there's no backup because all the other double O's are, I don't know, working like postal fraud or something that day. So they, <laughs> they, they can't come to his rescue. But, but in this, there was the opportunity to have a, a wider cast of characters. And for me, that was really interesting because what I'm particularly I interested in writing about is, is relationships. So relationships between characters and also the relationship that, that writing creates with a, with a reader, um, you know, the relationship that we're all forming in the room now. So if you have this wide cast of characters and they can all have histories with each other, then that gives you such a sort of rich tapestry for storytelling. So I, I hope that it kind of expands the universe um, in, in the way that the MCU does and, and gives maybe endless possibilities for storytelling. Well, um we do have to finish. As I say, I love talking about James Bond, and, <laughs> and I love talking to you, you too. Kim, and, and could stay here all night, but you've probably got lives to get on with. <laughs> um, but please give a huge round of applause to Kim. <laughs> who, um, 